Hi, everyone. This week, we're going to finish off with the cognitive perspective by talking about some of the processes that cognitive psychologists are very interested in. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about thinking, the process of organizing, reframing, restructuring information, and then communicating that information. Your text will focus on mental images and the development of concepts. In this video, we're going to spend some time talking about problem solving, intelligence, and a little bit of time on language. Let's begin by talking about problem solving. Humans are really amazingly, surprisingly good problem solvers. And this is largely because of our ability to use heuristics and other sorts of mental shortcuts when we're attempting to solve problems. Have you ever, for example, stayed in a hotel with a different kind of key than you've used before? Just this last weekend, I stayed at a hotel and I got the key and I walked up to the door and I noticed that there was no place to put the key card in or to slide the key in. Uh, there was no sort of opening for the card to fit in. Now, I could employ several different methods to attempt to solve this problem to get into the room. I could use a brute force method where I try every single possible solution until one works or I run out of possible solutions. I could try an algorithm, a series of steps that I start from beginning and follow through until the end, or I could use a heuristic, a mental shortcut, where I compare the problem I have now to every similar problem that I've faced before and try the things that seem to make the most sense. In this case, all I needed to do was touch the card to the handle and the lock would open. Using my prior knowledge to shortcut things that would be ineffective is a reason why humans are so good at problem solving. These heuristics or mental shortcuts are only really visible when they make mistakes, which again is not so often. Your book talks about several of these heuristics. I wanted to mention the availability heuristic in particular. Remember, this heuristic is where we judge the probability of an event based on how memorable examples of that event are. The classic example of the availability heuristic is fear of flying. After a plane crash or some other kind of incident is reported in the news, people overwhelmingly overestimate the probability of danger during a flight. Just having a vivid memory available affects our problem-solving ability by affecting our perception of a risk. Your book also discusses confirmation bias. And confirmation bias is fascinating and really important to understand because it can really influence your decision-making. Over hundreds of studies over the course of the last 50 years or so we demonstrated that people tend to attend to information that confirms their pre-existing beliefs and ignore information that disconfirms those beliefs. This is why, for example, you might feel like you always hit the red lights when you're running late to work. Well, you only notice that you hit the red lights when you're running late because it's the only time that it's important. And you don't pay attention to the times when you hit the green lights, and you don't pay attention to how frequently you hit red lights when you're not in a hurry. That's a pretty inconsequential example. But think about how confirmation bias might work in the case of stereotyping and prejudice. If I have a pre-existing judgment that a group is, say, violent or thuggish, then I will attend to information that reinforces that stereotype. I'll only remember things that support it, and I'll have trouble remembering things that don't support it. This means that it's very difficult to break down stereotypes even when we supply people with information that is counter to those stereotypes. But again, overall, humans are very good at problem solving. This image, the creation of man, is the center of the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican in Rome. I use this image because it's meant to represent the moment when Adam achieved sentience or intelligence, the moment the human brain came alive with the ability to learn and process information, which is what intelligence is. A small bonus that I'll put below, tell me your thoughts on what you think the image on the right looks like. Think about our course content thus far and if it reminds you of anything we've talked about. I think about intelligence as a general construct that indicates your ability to adapt and change to shifting demands. The question of intelligence is whether or not it should be considered a single construct, either you have intelligence or you have lower intelligence or whether it should be considered a multifaceted construct where you can have different kinds of intelligences that don't necessarily predict one another. Your text overviews the sort of development of these theoretical perspectives. 
but it's generally agreed that there is some sort of G factor, a general intelligence, that indicates the correlation between the different types of other intelligences. For example, while there are analytical intelligences, creative intelligences, and practical intelligences, people high in one of those categories have, in general, a high level of another of those categories. That is, they're positively correlated with one another. However, people certainly show adeptness at different categories of intelligence. Perhaps you might find yourself very verbally intelligent, able to read and process verbal information very easily, while another might find themselves mechanically or musically intelligent. Because intelligence is so multifaceted, and because, like any psychological construct, it's impossible to measure physically, intelligence is a good place to start to talk about the way that we measure constructs in psychological science. Remember from the first units when we were talking about operational definitions. We'll talk about an operational definition of intelligence, the IQ test. In order for a test of any construct to be valuable, it really needs three qualities. It needs to be reliable, valid, and standardized. The reliability of a test is just whether or not the test gives the same results every time it's taken. In other words, if I give you an IQ test over and over and over again, and it gives very different results each time you take the test, well, that's not a reliable test, and I certainly can't predict anything from it because your score itself is not predictable. In order for a test to be valid, we have to be able to demonstrate that the test measures the construct that it's supposed to measure or that it's intended to measure. A valid test, for example, is hitting the target construct. What this means for intelligence is that a valid test of intelligence is measuring the construct of intelligence, not something else that might be related to intelligence, and it's not missing pieces of intelligence. For example, shoe size might be a reliable measure of intelligence because your shoe size is unlikely to change every time I measure it, but it's not a valid measure of intelligence because your shoe size has nothing to do with your intelligence. Finally, any test should be standardized. The purpose for standardizing a test is so that you can compare the score of any individual to the norms. If, for example, I say you have an IQ of 132 and I give you no other information, that doesn't tell you much of anything. But if I tell you you have an IQ of 132 and that the average IQ in the United States is 100 and the standard deviation of the IQ in the United States is about 15 points, then you know that you're two standard deviations above the mean for intelligence. And because intelligence is normally distributed, we can make estimates based on those standardizations of where you fall in the distribution of the population. So I can say, if you have 132 IQ, that you're in about the 98th percentile of IQ. That is, there are only about 2% of the population that has a higher IQ than you do. If the test was not standardized, or you didn't have that standardization information, then that score wouldn't be interpretable. So in order for a test to be a good test, and in order for IQ to be a good test of intelligence, it has to be reliable across time, it has to be a valid measure of the construct of interest, and it has to be standardized so that the scores are interpretable. Your score is an attempt to describe your intelligence, one of the goals of psychology. Recall that the next goal is to explain, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. What I want to mention now is how we can use IQ to predict. A good test is a predictive test. And even though there are certainly many problems with the IQ as a measure of intelligence, some of which are detailed in your textbook, like its cultural sensitivity, it still is a very valuable predictor of things like academic success and future earning potential. So since we're using this measure to describe and predict, we should think about how to explain it. Where does this intelligence come from? Intelligence is also a good construct to use to talk about the concept of behavioral genetics. You've probably considered the nature and nurture debate at some point in your academic career. The idea that whether a behavior is based in our genes or our environment. You've also probably come to understand that the answer to that question is always some combination of both. The basic idea of behavioral genetics is that all behavior can be explained by some combination of heritability, or the genetic influence, and environment, or the influence of everything else that the organism experiences. We can use that framework to estimate the proportion of differences between people in intelligence that's attributable to differences in their genes. 
We do this by comparing differences in people's intelligence based on whether or not they share the same genes and whether or not they share the same basic environment. For example, let's say we were to compare the average correlation between identical twins who were raised together's intelligence and the average correlation between identical twins raised apart's intelligence. If identical twins raised together, on average, had more similar IQs than identical twins raised apart, we would know that the shared environment contributes something to intelligence. If then, for example, we were to compare the similarity of IQs between identical twins and fraternal twins, and we see that identical twins have more similar IQs than fraternal twins, we would demonstrate that there's some genetic component to intelligence. And in fact, that's what we find. What we find that about 70% of the differences between people in their intelligence is determined by differences in their genes. Now, I want to be really clear that this isn't to say that 70% of your IQ is from your genes and 30% is from your learning. Instead, 70% of the differences between people in a population are attributable to differences in their genes, and about 30% is attributable to differences in their environments. Language, I think, reflects humanity's greatest gift. It is, perhaps, our ability to project ourselves backwards and forwards in time, using words to construct the thoughts that help us both plan for the future and learn from our pasts. Noam Chomsky and his student Steven Pinker, among other modern psychologists and communications professionals, argue that language appears to be inborn and natural for humans, that we have an instinct for language. In fact, there are only a few humans who haven't been able to develop some kind of language ability, and those humans were raised in isolation from other human beings and had a variety of other problematic disabilities that prevented them from being able to acquire language. Communication between each other is at the absolute heart of what it means to be human. So much so that two different language cultures thrown together will within a single generation produce a functional creole or pidgin language that combines the two. And within two generations, that language will be generative in creating its own words and be alive and well. We are the animal of speech. And many studies demonstrate the benefits of multilingualism showing both cognitive and, even somewhat surprisingly, health and well-being, longevity benefits from learning other languages. I strongly encourage you to immerse yourself in other languages and cultures. It's just about the best workout you can get for your brain. And if you'll look at the last section of the chapter talking about ways to improve your thinking, you'll find that language learning is a really valuable tool. I hope that this section in cognition has really opened your mind to thinking about itself thinking about the way that you approach problems, about the biases that sort of infect our ability to make rational and clear decisions, and about the value of the words that we speak and the way that those words can help construct our reality. I look forward to your thoughts and especially your experiences in the Psychology in Action assignment this week.